Booker for his last class. His talks this week were entitled, What Did Jesus Really Mean? And his last words for us uh, today, well, he'll be speaking on us every idle word. With that, I give you Brother Mark Whitaker. Morning, y'all. <laughs> I've been told this week that I've not been integrating that well with you all, so <laughs> I have no idea which part of America that comes from, but, but I'm sure it was closer to an American accent than Guy's was to an English one. <laughs> okay. I know that wasn't a minute, was it? It was, it was long enough. Are we on screen? Sort of. Hold on. Hmm. Ironic, really. There are uh, there are times in life, aren't there, brothers and sisters, when we we say something really ill-advised and uh, and immediately regret it. Yeah, a bit like, uh, you know, asking Guy last night to tell me about his love of the Browns. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not thinking of those kind of, uh, of ill-advised words. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the more serious ones. You know, there are those times, aren't there, where we, you know, you and I, we speak without thinking... And, and no sooner are the words out of our mouth than we, we realise what a big mistake we made in, in what we said. And we, we so regret it and, and we, we wish we could take our words back. How many times have you, have you done that in your life? You know, you, you wished you could just rewind. Um, and it's too late, isn't it? It's too late. The wor- once the word, words are cheap, but once they're out there, You know, a few, just a few careless words can be so damaging, can't they? Just how damaging can they be, words? Well, that that seems to be the subject of the the comments that the Lord Jesus makes. Um, Brothers and sisters, just open your Bible with with me, if you will, please, to Matthew 12. Um, This is why we had some of these verses read this morning as our our introductory reading. Matthew 12. And Jesus tells us just how how serious a business this is. Uh, There in in Matthew 12 and verse 36, this is where our theme comes from. Jesus says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And that's, that, that's a really tough message from the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Uh, when we read it like that, brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus... Uh, appears to be saying to you and me there that our words can be the thing that justifies us or the thing that condemns us. That on the day of judgment, we will have to give an account before the great judge for our words, including, as he says, every, every idol. I don't know what your version says, every careless word, maybe, every empty Word. Those are the, some of the other versions. You know, it, when, when you just take those two verses by themselves, brothers and sisters, and, I, and this is, I want to share with you th- this morning the danger of verses out of context. But when you take those verses on their own, it leaves you and me with the, with the, uh, the impression that the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ will be, uh, will be all about us having to talk through the, uh, the painful uh, circumstances of our life, the things that we've done that we wish we hadn't, the things that we've said that we wish we had, had never said, that that will all be gone through 
by the Lord Jesus as we stand before him. And there's a massive problem with that view, brothers and sisters. There's a huge problem with us taking those two verses and reading that message from them. Because our salvation is not by works or by inference, by our words. You know, you think of how often that comes out in Scripture. Paul, to the Ephesians, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I mean, you know, I can't see any of us boasting before the judgment seat, but Paul says, it, our salvation is not by works, um, or as he says in Romans 5, therefore, having been justified, not by our words, but by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. Or this one, if you can read the squiggly writing. Um, the writer in Hebrews, quoting from the Old Testament, says, My righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will take no pleasure in him. But we are not of those drawing back to destruction, but of faith to the preserving of the soul. We live and will live and will be justified by our faith. So the, the idea then that, that you know, somehow, you know, a, a word here, or, or a word there, an idle word that we, that we say that's out of place, uh, will be the basis of our judgment on the great day of, of Christ when he comes. You know, that view does not fit with, with the rest of, of the really powerful scriptural teaching that, that you and I rely on. And we rely on it, brothers and sisters, because if we were judged for every idle word... Where would you and I be on the day of judgment? Where at all? Which is why these two verses are in this series. What did Jesus really mean? Because, you know, we can't deny that he said that, can we? Because there it is, recorded in Matthew's Gospel for us. What did Jesus really mean? Well, I've got a couple of things I want to, uh, to share with you um, to, to try and get us through this. And first of all, of course, and you, you're going to be uh, going to be fed up of me saying this, but I take comfort in what Sean said before. Um, you know, it's uh, as you roll your eyes, I know that I've struck gold. Um, <laughs> context is everything, isn't it? Um, verse 33 is the immediate context uh, in Matthew 12, where Jesus says... Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. A tree is known by its fruit. Thankfully, uh, so that we know what we're picking uh, when we go to a tree. You know, what's inside is what comes out. Uh, and therefore, the Lord Jesus is saying quite rightly to us that, that, that what's in our heart is reflected so often, so accurately by what comes out of our mouth. Our, our words reflect what, what's uh, our true attitude towards our God. And uh, it's interesting to see how this is kind of elaborated on in, in the words of the Lord Jesus that Luke records for us. He says, a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, for every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, 
and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks our words so often so much are a reflection of who we are yeah and that's that's quite sobering, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Because uh, cause we all, don't we, to a, a greater or a lesser degree, try to hide the sort of people we are. You know, I, I do it plenty. I try and, uh, try and not let on what kind of person is, is inside Mark Whitaker's skin. But you can only do that for so long, can't you? And, uh, and what's inside always, always comes out, ultimately. Um, James, uh, James, who heard so much of what the Lord Jesus had to say, uh, tells us, um, and, and I'm sure he's reflecting on, on what Jesus had said here. Talking of the tongue, he says, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James is given exactly the same message there, isn't he? That ultimately, no matter how hard we we try and sort of hide uh, what we are like inside, you know, a spring... A spring is ultimately either fresh water or it is salty water. You know, and if you if we take if we take that that immediate context that the Lord Jesus is giving there to, to what we've read in Matthew 12, then 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 in a, in a sense then y- yes, our words will justify or condemn us on on the day of judgment. Not, not because of the odd thing said here or there, but, but because like, like our actions, um, our, our words are a reflection of, of what's going on inside. They, our words hold up a mirror, don't they, to the, uh, the kind of person that we are inside. They, they, our words, like our works, demonstrate whether you and I are men and women of faith or whether we're just play acting. You know, and the act, a bit like the accent, it it drops, doesn't it, after a little bit of trying. And that's, uh, that's what the Lord Jesus says later on, isn't it, in, in Matthew 25. We're going to come back to Matthew 25, but uh, let me just, maybe I'll just quote it for you at the moment. You know, the king says, Come, you blessed are my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was sick and in prison. You visited me. You did it to one of the least of these my brethren, and in doing so, you did it to me. You know, it's, it's the works, not the works by them, it's the works of faith in, in the life of a brother or sister in Christ. And it's the, the words of faith which show to the Lord Jesus Christ the sort of people that, that you and I are. So, in a sense, uh, you know, if we look at the broader context, when Jesus talks about our words justifying us or condemning us, we can kind of understand it a bit more now, can't we? This is, this is Jesus saying, because our words, our words show the kind of people we are. Out of the good treasure of his heart, a good man brings forth good things. That's not, that's not good enough for me, though, as, a, as an explanation of what Jesus says here. Because are you still in Matthew 12, if you are? You know, look at the, uh, look at the consequences Jesus talks about here. Uh, verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment 
you know, I, ca I can understand now from what the Lord Jesus says how my words, my words, you know, across the whole of my life of faith, you know, that those words will, will show the kind of judgment that I will receive from the Lord Jesus because my words are a reflection of the kind of person that I am and your words, they're a reflection of the kind of person you are. That, you know, that I get now. But Jesus says here, we will give account of our words at the judgment seat, especially every idle word. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. That still jars, brothers and sisters. That, that I, you know, is Jesus saying to me that I will stand before him on that day and have to relive every, every one of those ill-thought-out conversations with him? It, it still doesn't make sense, does it, brothers and sisters? Because, because that, that's not what saves or justifies me uh, or, or condemns me, is it? We've already seen, haven't we, that, that we are saved by our faith, by, by the, the grace, undeserved as it is, from our God. You know, here's the thing. The, 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 the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ... If it's effective in our lives, brothers and sisters, it has covered up every single one of our sins. Every one. And that, that, means, uh, that means every one of those idle words as well. You know, every idle word that's a sin, if, if his soul has been a sacrifice for us and we've made it that sacrifice, then then it's all forgiven. Not a single idle word that I have spoken will be recounted by the Lord Jesus on, on the day of judgment. That's the point that the, the Apostle Paul, you know, in, in such a powerful letter is about this very fact, uh, the letter to the Romans. Paul says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No condemnation. Now, brothers and sisters, don't, don't get me wrong here. I, I don't imagine for one minute that on the day of judgment, you and I will not be condemning ourselves. That we won't go before the Lord Jesus and say... I can't tell you how sorry I am for, for, for this and this and, and this and this and this. You know, every idle word we've spoken, we'll, we'll remember it, won't we? We'll, we'll, be, we'll be pouring it out before the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conscience, and, and I'm sure that we'll all have that conscience, and our consciousness of our sins will be very strong on that day. But from the Lord Jesus, the judge, there is no condemn. That's it, isn't it? There is no condemnation. Because for the elect of God, only the good is, uh, is recounted to us. Because the, sin, the sins have all gone. You know, I mean, either they've gone, brothers and sisters, or they've not. And for you and me, by God's grace, they'll be gone. You know, let's, I just want you to just come back over to, to Matthew 25. Uh, keep your finger in Matthew 12, of course. You know, we, we've got to look, don't we, at the detail and the context, of course. Look at the detail of what Jesus says. You know, I know, I know it's a parable. But uh, this is one of those parables where Jesus actually seems to, to layer it with a lot of, of the reality. And uh, Matthew 25, and in verse 34, he'll say, uh, verse 34, yeah. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit.
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. There is no mention, is there, in, in that long list that the Lord Jesus gives to the sheep on his right hand. He doesn't say, you know, but there was, there was that week you didn't bother to visit. What happened then? He says, you know, when I was missing socks, where were you with the socks you could have bought in Tabitha's treasures that you could have given me? It's not there, is it? The Lord Jesus Christ, he only, he only mentions the works of faith because that's all, that's all he remembers. This is, this is the, the misunderstanding that it seems to uh, sometimes be, be, be endemic within our community. Uh, this view of the judgment seat of, of you and me standing in line <laughs> the sort of traditional view of us being stuck there for 40 years at Mount Sinai or something like that um, and I'm going to be right at the back because I'm a W aren't I um, pity the Yoakums <laughs> all, all the Zabos or whatever <laughs> you know You know, that's such a, such a false image we have, isn't it, of the, uh, of the judgment seat. The judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ is not like human judgment seats. It's not the court of law where we hear the good, the bad and the ugly about us and, and see whether somehow on the balance of probability the Lord Jesus somehow counts us innocent. It's not like that. It's the place where you and I, if we are covered by the grace of God then that side of the scales is absolutely empty uh, against us. We will never have to account for all the things that we've said that we later have regretted. Uh, that still leaves me with a problem, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Because we go back to, to uh, Matthew chapter 12 now and verse 36. And the Lord Jesus says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. What do we need to do to get our heads around this, brothers and sisters? We need to look at something. It's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, thank you, Curtis. It shows me he has been sitting awake through these studies. Well done. We've, we've got to look at the, the wider context, don't we, again? And actually, uh, we, we are going to look back at some words we already looked at. We looked at yesterday. We looked at them yesterday because uh, this, this talk today I only wrote last week, whereas yesterday's talk I wrote in January uh, and then forgot what I'd written about. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then we put the two together and thought, oops. Uh, but go back to verse 22, because, you know, there's a massive context, isn't to to all of, of what we read here. Um, verse 22, then, one was brought to Jesus, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. You know, remember, we remember don't we the scribes and the Pharisees there seeing these amazing things were saying that Jesus was healing by the power of Beelzebub you know say it just came so easy to them didn't it that they could look at the the power of God and ridicule the Lord Jesus Christ doing miracles of all things you know they undermined him at every step of the way they criticized his every word and action even when it was so clear that here was a man using the power of God God. These are the idle words that the Lord Jesus is referring to. It's what they were saying just so easily uh, against him and against the things that he, were doing, he was doing. You know, it was a very specific condemnation that the Lord Jesus gives. And actually, you, I think you can tell in, in verse 36, because Jesus doesn't say every, uh, every idle word that you may speak, does he? 
he says, every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of. Actually, I think maybe that was some comfort to his disciples, not only that the Lord Jesus wasn't speaking about them, but that Jesus was turning the big guns on the scribes and the Pharisees. Imagine how much it hurt the disciples to hear this stuff. You know, the things that people said about their master, and he says, don't you worry about that. Don't you worry. One day they will, they will have to give account for those things. Very specific indeed, isn't it? And actually, everything that Jesus goes on to say in this whole next section of the chapter is, is against the, these men. Let's just have a pick, pick it up, because this is Jesus' defense against absolute blasphemy um, on the lips of those men. Verse 24. There's the accusation then. This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. What does Jesus say? Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So the first thing Jesus does is he just demolishes the argument, doesn't he? He wipes the decks with it. You know, think about what you silly people are saying. You know, this, you're, you're destroying your own arguments by being so ridiculous. How can Beelzebub fight against himself, even if there is no such thing? Verse 27 then, he says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? How, uh, therefore they shall be your judges. So the second thing Jesus does, he says, Look, you, you're condemning yourselves. If I'm casting out demons by Beelzebub, what about you, what about you lot? Your, your own followers do this. Um, so who are they doing it by? You have your own exorcists. And then he goes on, verse 28, to say, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And you know, in, in Luke's record of the, this verse, Luke has slightly different words. He says, if I do this by the finger of God, the finger of God. Now, where do, where do we come across that phrase in Scripture? Jesus is drawing that from right back uh, in the book of Exodus. When, when you get, what, three, three um, or four plagues in, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he didn't heed them just as the Lord had said. You know, e even to the ungodly Egyptians, it became clear at this point, this was the work of God. This was the power of Israel's God. And it's even clearer now, isn't it, when the Lord Jesus is doing this, these miracles, that this is, this is the power of God, the Holy Spirit working through him. And Jesus then is saying, are, are, you, are you even more stupid than Pharaoh and his magicians? Are you blinder than, than even they were? Even the magicians of Egypt being made to look fools, J Jannies and Jambres, isn't it? Um, Jesus says, even they recognized it, and now, and now you don't. What about verse 29? Here's a, uh, an unusual one. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? That's, that's another one I could have just done as a talk. You know, what does Jesus really mean? What does he really mean there? In, uh, in, in this verse. This is another one that Jesus uh, plunders, pardon the pun, from the Old Testament. This time from Isaiah. Because in Isaiah 49, in one of the servant, uh, the servant prophecies, the prophet says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, the strong man, or the captives of, of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will continue Contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. And this is, uh, this is Isaiah in this prophecy. He's talking about the power of God to deliver his people, little nation of Judah, from the unbeatable Assyrians. 
to the point where even the captives, even the captives that the Assyrians had already taken away from Israel and Judah were going to be free. The, 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 the captives of the mighty would, would be free. And, and they, would, they would plunder the Assyrians, wouldn't they? All those dead men outside Jerusalem with all the plunder of war and the plunder of the mighty would become Judah's plunder instead. God gave to the people of Judah in Isaiah's time an, imp an impossible deliverance from the mighty. And Jesus is doing the same again. Because Jesus... He's the one who can overcome the strong man, can't he? Jesus is the one who delivers from sin and plunders him. And uh, maybe Jesus is also thinking of this servant song of Isaiah, where Isaiah says of Jesus, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he will, shall divide the spoil with the strong because he's poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors and uh, you know the, the miracles that the Lord Jesus is doing here all, the, all those healings that Jesus does they're, they're a foretaste of his victory aren't they? They, they they give a foretaste of all the benefits that come through Jesus' victory over the strong man over sin and over death that, uh, that, that one day all those who are sick will be healed. <coughs> will be healed. They'll even overcome the gates of, uh, of death and, and Hades itself. Yeah, and Jesus is taking these ideas from the Old Testament. You know, these men, the scribes, the Pharisees, the ones who, who uh, prided themselves on being able to, what was it, sticking all through the law and tell you which letters had been pierced. They should have understood what they were seeing and they didn't understand it. As he says in verse 30, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You know, since it, since it was so clear that the Lord Jesus was, was using not the power of the king of the devils, but the power of, of God himself to, to, to do all, all these amazing miracles, to, to achieve the impossible, then for the, for the scribes and the Pharisees not to accept that, not to acknowledge it and appreciate it, meant, didn't, it didn't mean that they were agnostics, that they were sitting on the fence. Jesus says it, it means you're against me. You are, you are the wolves scattering the sheep. You're not the shepherd gathering the sheep together. You're the, you're the wolf that scatters. That brings us to another slightly puzzling uh, uh, thing that Jesus says here. This is the, uh, this is the chapter of, uh, of, of odd sayings, isn't it? Verse 31. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. So, and so we, we, we always ask ourselves, don't we, brothers and sisters, well, what, what is this? What is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that uh, Jesus talks about? You know, what's this unforgivable sin that, that he raises here uh, at this point? And it's clear, isn't it, from... What's it clear from? The context. It's clear from the context. It's deliberate disbelief in what the Lord Jesus is doing. E even when these men had undeniable, absolutely undeniable proof in front of them. This is the finger of God. And yet they deliberately disbelieved. They said, he has an unclean spirit. This fellow doesn't cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. That's, that's how he's doing this. this. This is an ingrained unbelief 
that these, these people have, isn't it? And, and you know, when there's, when there's no hint there, and there hasn't been all through the ministry, no hint of any change of attitude, of, of, of thinking about it and going, mm, I, need to, I need to rethink this one. When, when, when there is no evidence of change, then there is also no hope of forgiveness. Because when an attitude is hardened against God, sin cannot be forgiven. And it's interesting, you know, that, uh, that in, in what Jesus says here, he isn't, he's not bothered about the jibes against himself as a person. You know, these people, they called Jesus a glutton. They said he was a wino. You know, they, they said this... This, this guy mixed with the, the undesirables of society, what kind of a man was he? He, he? Jesus didn't care about that. But what he did care about was when these men made comment against the power of his heavenly Father. That power which he wielded, and Jesus says that, that can't be forgiven, either in this age... And I believe Jesus is talking about the age he lived in, the, the Mosaic age, or in the age to come, that new age which was going to dawn, the age of the, uh, of the gospel going out to the Gentiles. It, this, was, this was an intransigent and, uh, and an unbelieving attitude towards the Lord Jesus and the, 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 the evidence that he provided that God was working through him. And he, we, I think Sean picked it up, you know, the, the times when Jesus said, you know, if you don't believe me, at least believe the works. Because there was the undeniable evidence. And Jesus said, your denial of that, that was a sin that could not be, could not be forgiven because it never changed. They, they never, they never came away from that position and it, and it led time and again to so many blasphemous words. Those, those are the idle words. This man's, this is the power of, of the devil that this man is wielding. Those were the idle words that Jesus says, one day you'll stand before the great throne and you'll have to explain why you said that in the face of such an power. It's when Jesus talks about idle words, brothers and sisters, I hope I've, uh, I hope I've made it clear to you, he's, he's not talking about the, the unwise words, the regrettable words that you and I, you and I say and then, and then we, we bitterly wish that we never said. Because the very, the very regret that we have shows that that's, that's not the kind of people we're trying to be. That, that actually we are, we are people who are, are trying to be a, a different sort altogether. You know, these idle words, well, if only they were one-offs. This was the, the belittling of the Son of God and the, the power of God which he wielded. I just want to, I want to finish off, brothers and sisters, just by circling back round, um, mainly because I had half a page of notes still uh, to, to come. Um, I just want to, to finish uh, on, on what is so positive in all of this. Because, because we aren't we aren't the scribes and the Pharisees, are we, by the, by the grace of God. But I want to think about the way the judgment seat is, is going to be such a different place for different people. And I want to do that just by going back to, back to Matthew 25 again. We, we looked at it before, but uh, I, don't, I don't want anybody going away from, from this gathering or any gathering or any Sunday morning meeting um, with, with the wrong image of, of the judgment seat that the Lord Jesus so clearly wants to paint for us. Here we go. Matthew 25, uh, first parable, parable of the ten virgins. Uh, verse uh, 10, while the foolish went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Those who were ready went in. Uh, as it slipped your mind that those who were ready had also nodded off. Yeah, remember, they, they were all woken up 
by the cry that the bridegroom was coming. You know, and there's not there's no record of a conversation as they as they go there to say caught you out, didn't I then? You, you, were, you, you got bleary eyes. What happened to you while, uh, while you were waiting for me? You know, there's none of that. There's no, oh, you know, and, and, and the five wise went in, but you know, the one at the back was at the back because their, their lamp was like a little bit shaky. It was, you know, right on the edge of going out. Those who were ready. That's the only comment made. Not that they slumbered or slept or almost ran out of oil. They were ready. That's how scripture records it, because that's how Jesus said it. Okay, the next parable, it, you know, it goes up a notch, doesn't it? Verse 21, parable of the talents. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know, though, two-talent man, he could have done so much better. You know, two became four, but five had become ten. You know, there's, there's none of that, is there? You know, when, when the servants come before the master, and you can, you can imagine, can't you, you know, two-talent man, he's seen five-talent man, uh, you know, who managed to make ten, and two-talent man's thinking, well, if only, if only I'd done a bit better. If only. And, and he comes and... and None of that is there. There's none of that downside. And this is, this is how Jesus tells it. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful. You were faithful. That's the point, isn't it? Not about the times he was a little bit faithless. And of course, the, uh, the praise we get then in, in the final parable, which we've already looked at. Pick it up again at verse 37. When the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And there's the point. Only, only the works of faith of these men and women are recounted. And for me, you know, that's, that's our greatest comfort, um, that through the, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus and the, the, the complete covering that it provides for you and me, we will not have to account for past sins at the judgment seat of Christ. No, no recounting of our... I will want to recount our failures. The Lord Jesus is having none of it. None of it at all. Instead, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the war, world. It has, a, it has a flip side, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? It does have a flip side. You know, those, those like Jesus is talking to in chapter 12, those who blaspheme God, th those, those who ridicule God's power, those who disbelieve the Lord Jesus Christ, those who, who choose to throw away faith. No amount of good deeds that they have done in their lives will provide an entry into the kingdom for those men and women. Uh, and the Lord Jesus in his parables, he shows that they, they have to account. The elect don't have to account, but those others have to account for their lack of faith and the works that come of faith. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in naked and you didn't clothe me sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. You know, and they, these, these are the, the men and the women in the world. And we pray to God, it is just those in, in the world, don't we, that that will have blasphemed God's power in, in this way. You know, and, and we might ask the question, going back to Matthew 12, what, 
you know, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which was so very much context, it was about what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. Is it something that you and I can do today? You know, we haven't got people going out doing miracles, have we? Performing them, uh, where we can say, well, there's the, there's the power of God being, being wrought there. Is it, is, it, is it possible today to deny the power of God, the visible power of God? Of course it is, brothers and sisters. Because you and I have, have got that in front of us. Every, every single day when we open God's Word, we have the power of God shown to us. The, the, the greatest work that the Lord God did through, through His Spirit. It provides for you and me un, unending evidence of our Creator and His power to save. And we live in a world where, where so many blaspheme that to ridicule it. You know, they pour scorn on the scriptures. And you know, when, when you have when you have painful conversations with men and women who uh, who poo-poo and, and just laugh at you because you're a believer in, in you believe this? Brothers and sisters, for every idle word that they speak against that power of God, they'll they'll need to account one day. But for you and me, here and now. And by God's mercy, for every day until the Lord Jesus returns, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Rather, brothers and sisters, we are of those who believe and will be saved.